she was just a loving lady who welcomed everybody. You knew that anybody that you um, were friends with or any friend, new friends that you met, she would, she would welcome them and make them feel at home. Just an overall great lady. Last month, after a vibrant and full life, Pula Sue passed away at the age of 87, surrounded by her family in Gisborne. She had 22 grandchildren and nine great-grandchildren. As one of the first Samoan women in Gisborne, her story touched the lives of many. She's passed on just her loving nature to, to me and a lot of my friends and family, they love her. You know, they meet her, even, even people that were looking after her in the hospital, in the ward, they fell in love with her as well. So I, I actually didn't realise until nearing her passing how really infectious her, her joy. Christians may call it joy of the Lord, but people who don't, you know, know, know um, her faith will know that she's a happy person and she just loves people so much. She was a joyous woman who would always have time for family, friends, um, no matter what time of the day or what part of life you are in, um, she would always welcome you in. To be honest, I didn't actually realise how cheeky Nana was because growing up for us that was the norm. So I feel like Nana, she just had jokes and she had such a wit and humour that was pretty quick, smart, but also just hilarious. Piola Sue was born in Samoa. Her grandfather had a mission for her that would be the beginning of an amazing journey. He said that we need you to go to, to New Zealand and uh, help this uh, European couple called, uh, a guy called Leo Fowler. He and his wife were returning back to New Zealand uh, to a place called Gisborne and to establish a radio station there. He requested, is there anyone in this village that can come with us to look after my son, Christopher? He wasn't really well and he needed care. So therefore her grandfather wanted her to go in 1952, just before her 18th birthday, Piola boarded a boat to New Zealand, leaving behind her family and the only way of life she knew. Being from a village in Savai'i, uh, from South Hotu, she would have come from a completely different background to a, a, a place like Gisborne, which was a very, um, probably a white middle class um, area for the people that she was with at the time and um, one thing about my mum was that she was a very strong Christian at the time and very strong in the Methodist church so she found a home uh, in 1952 with the Methodists of Gisborne and from there she made a lot of, a lot of friends in the, the Palangi congregation of the Methodist church. Piola spent time working helping families in Tapuya Springs, determined to help her family back home as much as she could. She was quite keen to work um, and send money back home because I think that was one of the reasons why Lefour wanted one of her, his family to, to go over to New Zealand with this Palangi couple uh, for the future of their family to bring money home to the family and to eventually bring the family over to New Zealand for some opportunities and education. While doing her nursing training in Auckland, Piola made a phone call to a friend that would change her life forever. She did ring a girl from her village. She tried to contact her and, and the girl was staying at a house in Grey Lynn. She, was, she asked for the girl's name and when my dad answered the phone, he. He heard this, this, this young lady speaking in Samoan, but she, her accent seemed a lot different to everyone else's accent that, that he was in his network. And so he, they started chatting and he, he seemed to get quite excited about this, this so-called uh, Samoan girl. I don't think she ended up talking to the girl that she was actually asking for. That's how they met. Piola married John in 1959 and they moved to Gisborne to raise their seven children. The family was very involved in the Gisborne Methodist Church, starting a Samoan language service to cater to the increasing number of Samoan families in Gisborne, her faith helping her through the darkest of times. I will always remember Mum, we lost two sisters in 1985. Just saw her, you know, sitting between the two coffins of her children and um, 
and looked at her and thought, wow, she's something's keeping her strong. I knew it was her faith. She doesn't look like someone who's just lost two daughters and uh, her husband, you know, just uh, recovered from their car accident. I always remember that, seeing her in that situation and knowing that she was very strong, despite, I'm sure, the heartbreak. Being the first Pacifica woman to be ordained into the Methodist Church of New Zealand came with its own struggles. Her husband was also a minister. So in the Samoan context, there's a minister and then there's his wife. They have their own roles, which are both very important. So she was doing something different when she candidated for ministry. And of course, she came up against a lot of, there was backlash because she was a woman. She shouldn't be doing that, especially because her husband is a minister as well. When her husband died in 1991, Piola took over running the Samoan services at the Methodist Church. But she would be hit yet again with another challenge, becoming ill with meningitis while attending a women's church conference in Auckland in 1996. She came through meningitis. The only sad thing was that she lost her hearing and she was deaf. And when she came back to Gisborne, it didn't deter her, it seemed to inspire her to fight back, to continue ministry work, continue community work with her preschool, continue meeting people and helping people, and she didn't want to give up on anything. Through all these trials and tragedies, her love and joy has always been evident. She's actually taught me to laugh we laugh a lot about things which other people would probably cry about. And it's, it's a weird thing, I don't know if it's a Sue thing. We, we just seem to mock and then we just move on. And it's like, oh, that's our counselling session. <laughs> she loved all of us, especially we went over to 64 Ormond Road where she lived. That's where um, we, a lot of us spent time with her and um, got close to her and where she just cherished every one of us. There was a time when Nana was staying with us and I got upset with her because Nana's also quite stubborn and we all are and I remember I went downstairs just to get away from her and she was actually on crutches and wasn't meant to be able to move downstairs. She saw I was upset and before you know it she was like down the hall coming up to me going Julia, Julia. I was like oh my goodness that are you meant to coming down the stairs. But I think that was a memory that taught me again that Nana was willing to fight even through her own pain just for, for her grandchildren and for to ensure that there was still peace in her relationships. Her infectious laugh and favourite phrase, praise the Lord, could be heard wherever she was, her life a blessing to many others. If I can be even a quarter of what she was in, in her life, living here on earth, I would be just so happy. I'd be I'd feel proud of that. Renee Lolly here, local focus.